Today, I'm going essentially to uh, give practical details, just uh, to allow you to quick start with answers. Okay? So, I will not describe the details today. Essentially, I will try to help you uh, start reading it. Okay? So, give you all, uh, all details that you need to know in order to do so. Okay? Um, I will um, describe the series, yes? Isn't it microphone on? It should be. Maybe just, yeah, it's on a baby show. Okay. 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 Um, is it better now? Okay. So I will um, also dis give you a series of tests and problems which are in classical uh, in this uh, area. And uh, I will invite you to try to do those tests and to use them as a starting uh, basis uh, to use the RAM tests and maybe then you can modify some of them to go on and to perform a more advanced uh, simulation. Um, on Tuesday, I will uh, really go uh, in, in the very heart of the server, so MHD and hydro server, so I will, I will review uh, say the equations, so you'll see many equations today, uh, tomorrow, um, how do we actually solve uh, those equations, and I will also speak about the stability issue and the second order accuracy method. Uh, Wednesday I'm going to finish this, it will probably take more than one hour. Uh, and then I will uh, spend some time on um, dealing with the issue of uh, DB, which has to be uh, maintained to zero in the case of uh, MHD. Um, and on the Thursday, I will discuss more specific AMR issues, the, the difficulty which are specific to uh, AMRs, and also describe uh, a bit the gravity solvers, uh, the grid solvers, not the tree solvers, uh, which have been uh, well been explained to, uh, by the private sector. Um, and then finally, Friday, uh, I will give uh, scientific talks um, in which Ramses has been extensively used. And so the topic will be formation of disk and binary rays during the collapse of magnetized dense cores, trying to emphasize uh, the importance of magnetic field. Okay? Right. So um, I'm starting just uh, to give some quick uh, history of Ramses. So it has been developed by Roman Pessier, who is now in Zurich. So originally designed for cosmology simulation. Um, and uh, amongst the largest cosmology simulation have been done with RAMSES. Maybe I should uh, take this opportunity to say that, as you see, I'm not the developer of RAMSES. So there are many bits I know, but there are also many bits I don't know. Uh, so I may not be always uh, able to answer your question at the deepest level if there are extremely detailed questions. Huh? Um, so the first version uh, handled uh, dark matter particles which, uh, as was described previously, are uh, interacting only through gravity uh, and also some uh, hydrodynamics. So the, the, the spirit here is that we use the grid of gravity, so the, the particles are projected uh, onto the mesh using the so-called particle mesh techniques, uh, and then you can use uh, the, uh, the AMR to actually better describe uh, the regions that need more resolution. Okay? So unlike, for example, what you have in SPH, where uh, by definition your grid or your flow follows the matter, uh, here it's not the case. So you, you have to have to add, uh, I think by hand, more uh, grids where uh, the, the matter spies up, okay, or some criteria is, is met. It does not have to follow matter necessarily. You can uh, refine on uh, any quantity you want, and on any uh, criteria you decide to, okay? So in a sense, it's, it's, uh, uh, this AMR strategy is very um, flexible. Um, okay, so this is a 
kind of example of simulation which have been uh, performed with, with VAMSES. So this is a cosmological flow where you see the formation of all the of all the filaments and uh, maybe a dark halo and galaxy formings. And here you see the, the mesh, um, which you see is extremely refined. And here, for example, where you have this accumulation of gas, of, of black matter, and in the void, uh, the, the grid is very coarse, okay, because you don't need to be accurate here. Okay? Um, so, Um, so, uh, after this sort of first uh, version, many uh, developments have been uh, performed by various teams and are still uh, going on. So, uh, one important step was the inclusion of the magnetic field, uh, um, important particularly in the context of, of star formation, where uh, magnetic field, we believe, is uh, part of the, of the physics. Huh? We, don't, we think, I mean, that to a large extent the star properties are determined by the magnetic field. And uh, <coughs> so first it had been done um, for, for Danaro, so that was a pure kinematic uh, version, which means kinematic that essentially the Faraday equations uh, were solved, but not uh, but the Lorentz force was not included. No? It was only the velocity field uh, that was uh, modifying the magnetic field, but the, not the reverse. And also, in mean, about the same times, we, uh, we have uh, developed this ideal MHD version of the code, which then includes uh, the Lorentz force and the injection equation. Um, so, the, as I will describe tomorrow, uh, the essence of the method is a finite volume method, which allows to conserve the mass, energy, and the momentum. Uh, second order accuracy in time and space, and uh, use a constraint transport scheme that I will also describe Wednesday, which allows you to maintain dB uh, exactly zero, I mean within the machine uh, accuracy. Uh, more recent developments, a non ideal MHD effect. So th this is uh, public, huh? you, I hope you'll be uh, using it uh, in this school. Uh, non ideal MHD effects uh, are now introduced, which includes. Uh, on the polar diffusion, so the slip between the ions and the neutrals, and also the dissipations. Uh, that's not public yet, okay? And it will be, I'm sure it will become public at some stage, but that was not ready enough. Um, okay, so just to give you a sort of flavor, uh, this is uh, uh, of what, what we can do and, and how important the magnetic field can be. So this is a sort of decaying simulation run, where uh, the velocity uh, field is specified by hand using a sort of uh, uh, just a Gaussian distribution. And that's a supersonic simulation, so the max typically 10. So you, you see quick loops, you see uh, quickly the uh, series of shocks uh, developing and the filaments and sheet formings. Um, if you repeat the same calculation with uh, the magnetic field, <coughs> You see a, a big difference. Um, the, the shape of the structure that forms is obviously different, it's more filamentary. Uh, and um, you see the, the flow is kind of more rigid. Okay? So, of course, to, to see this better, you have to, to quantify using some statistical tools, but that can be seen by eye already. Uh, and it will have consequence on the type of object you will form at the end. Uh, the type, the, because the stars are, to some extent, uh, the properties of the stars will reflect, of course, the properties of the gas, the gas distribution. Um, what you will end up at the end will be different with and without magnetic field. Um, another uh, very important type of problems, which is the dense core collapse. Um, so you essentially have a, something like one genes mass, yeah, or two genes mass, yeah, okay, which collapse uh, under the influence of gravity, and uh, there is a little bit of rotation as well. So you see quickly uh, a bar uh, forming because of the conservation of angular momentum, which this bar becomes unstable, 
And uh, the system work up here in five uh, pieces, that would be five stars, maybe. Um, just want to stress that the symmetry here reflects the symmetry of the initial conditions. So if you look at the same things with, uh, like from the edge, I mean from the equatorial plan, you see all the dynamics which occurs uh, in, in the equatorial plan. If you repeat the same calculation again with the magnetic field, um, you see something which is completely different. Everything identical otherwise. Huh? And here the strength of the field uh, is, is considered as I mean, sort of strong in the sense that um, it is two times below the value you need for the magnetic field to compensate gravity. Okay? So if the field was two times larger, uh, the, the core would not collapse because the magnetic field would maintain uh, would, would uh, sort of compete with gravity. So here it's two times weaker. Still, the field is considered as being strong, and it's co it's comparable to the value which are typically observed uh, in the in the in the interstellar medium. So you see here the big difference with the previous case is that you have not formed any disk here, and just a single star. And the reason is because the magnetic field. Um, is twisted by the rotation. So you twist the field lines, and doing so, uh, you create a magnetic torque, which will then uh, propagate the, your alpha waves, by alpha wave, but torsional alpha waves, your angular momentum away. So you will transport your angular momentum from the very inner part of the clouds to the outer parts, okay? And then, because of this strong magnetic bracking, there is not enough angular momentum left and therefore you don't form a big disk, as it was the case uh, in the previous simulation. So that's one effect. And the other one, if you look now uh, at the equatorial plan, you see the formation of this outflow here. Uh, so you see now a lot of dynamics uh, is actually operating in this x plan, and you eject materials. Again, that's due to the, uh, the field line twisting, okay, due to rotation. So at some stage, not only you launch alpha waves, but you also uh, accumulate so much pressure, magnetic pressure, that you start expanding out. Mm -hmm. So you see um, from these two examples I show that the nature of adonomical flows and energy flows actually is very different. And it has strong consequence. And so tomorrow, uh, when I will describe the solver, uh, that will be uh, also an important uh, um, uh, aspect to consider, that the nature of these two flows are very, very different. Yes? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that this is an uh, arbitrary unit. So typically, that would be, uh, say, 1,000 AU across. Okay, and yeah, I should I say also that uh, here you, you, we, we use a lot the AMF capacity, uh, the size of the simulation would be maybe more than the size of the, of the room, something like that. And so the AMR allows you to uh, refine uh, these objects. Without an AMR uh, scheme, it would be a very, very difficult calculation to perform just because the resolution uh, you would need uh, to describe this, this object would uh, lead you to a very, very high uh, mesh. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I wanted uh, to mention some works going on. So, rapid transfer is now um, uh, included, and as Mark said before, we know it's important for star formation. So, um, explicit uh, treatment of magnetic of rapid transfer has been developed. Uh, this version is public, not this one, and this one is GPU, so it's not extremely. Easy to use, and there is also an implicit treatment which has been done. Um, I'm not going to describe that further because um, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, code are, I mean, there's part of the code that are not public yet. Um, just would like to stress so that, as you see, uh, the, the equation solved use this so called gray transfer approximation, which means you have just one wavelength. Uh, and all the opacities and so on have average over just one wavelength, which is a bit uh, uh, 
is a very poor approximation at the moment, and that's part of the uh, improvement which is required in this field. And also, uh, diffusion approximation is, is used, uh, which is also uh, something uh, a bit uh, too simplistic. It means there is a, uh, maybe the, 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 the propagation of the light is a bit too isotropic, and uh, one of the uh, improvements that would be needed uh, in the near future is to actually go beyond this approximation. Okay, so that's just to give you uh, a flavor of what's going on, because if you decide at some stage to use RAM sets, uh, this module will probably become soon available, and maybe uh, they can already be provided. And, uh, okay? So that could be part of your decision to use that card. Okay. <coughs> so I'm uh, entering now in the description of the code itself. Okay? Um, so the code structure, when you will uh, say download it and uh, uh, start looking at what you have inside, you will uh, find a couple of um, uh, directories. So the first one, so IMR, uh, contains obviously all the uh, IMR related parts. Okay? And uh, uh, the really the heart uh, of the, the Ramses uh, code is the so-called AMS step routine, which will uh, call all the all the modules. And uh, as we see, it, it's a bit a strange routine because it is calling itself, okay, many times, one pair of them. So you enter the routine at the at the core level, so the uh, the lowest refinement level, okay, and then you loop through. I mean, each time you have a new level, it, it calls itself. Okay, and, and then when you reach the highest uh, level in the simulation, it starts solving the equation, and then it, it, it goes down uh, into levels up to uh, the smallest level of refinement. Okay, so that's something you may want to uh, have a look if you would like to understand how RAMSES is exactly uh, working. Okay. Um, so then uh, you, you have two uh, directories, hydro and MHD, which obviously contains everything needed to solve either hydro or MHD. Uh, PM, so the particle mesh, um, I'm not going to describe this much because I'm not going to uh, use it in the context of this school. This is much for uh, cosmology, also uh, in the context of star formations. We sometimes use uh, things like sync particles, and I think um, maybe Paul and, and uh, Paul Clark and Robbie Banerjee will describe a bit more sync particles uh, during the next uh, two weeks. Um, then you have Poisson, which uh, is essentially some gravity on the mesh, Bin, which contains the MEC file and uh, the sources. NEMLIST uh, is something very useful for you. It contains um, various problems which are already set up. Okay? So to start uh, doing your first runs with RAMSES, you probably go in the NEMLIST and uh, you select one of them. I will describe them now, I will later. And then you start uh, launching RAMSES with the NEMLIST and you start modifying the NEMLIST to uh, make sure you understand exactly what you are doing and how you read the data and so on. Um, then there is another important um, directory for you, patch. That's where you, uh, you put the routine that you have to modify to set up a particular problem. Okay? So if in most cases, or in a lot of cases, you cannot Control or you cannot set up the simulation just from the from the name list. Huh? You have to modify some routine. So what you do is that you create a directory in this patch, uh, and then here you put all the routine you have been modifying for your own problem, and just those one. Okay, and then uh, by doing that you avoid having a thousand submission of Ramses. Uh, you just have a list of patch with a few routines modified each time. And when you compile the code, you take the routines there and not from the 
main uh, version of Ampres. Sorry? I, I, on chemistry, um, there are some, not, not in the main release, okay, uh, there are some efforts which have been, which are done now. I think there have been recently a paper uh, where chemistry uh, is included in Ramses. I don't know whether it's public or not. So, I mean, some, some, we are also doing it now, but it's at a very uh, preliminary stage. So, uh, at least it's, it's not public uh, at the moment. Okay, and then finally, you have this uh, util, uh, util uh, directory where you can find a lot of post-processing tools uh, that you uh, will use it also in the context of this tool. Okay, so then I guess you have to compile, and uh, this is uh, some, I mean, uh, I'm just put a warning here because the experience is that many problems uh, come from the compilation. So I will try to avoid you to get through them. Uh, so the first thing you have to specify is the dimension of the problem. It could be one, two, or three. Uh, then you have to specify the number of variables. So typically, uh, if you are doing the 3D hydro problem, you have five variables, the density, the pressure, and three velocity. If you are doing MHD, uh, that should be eight. And uh, the reason is because, and whatever the dimension, Okay. And the reason is because uh, you have uh, the free component of the magnetic field, uh, and that's true even if you are doing a 1D problem, because uh, if all your variables depend only on x, okay, you may still have a by and dz uh, velocity component that depend on x. Okay. Those um, variables in the uh, elemental case would be trivial, so they uh, Will be essentially constant, so there is no need to consider them. But that's not true in MHD because you have the magnetic tension of the field, which uh, uh, which comes from the B Y B Z component of the field, and that will create forces that modify the dynamic of the flow. Okay? Yeah. So if you're doing one test problem, you would specify three variables for hydro and five variables for MHD. Yeah, eight in total. You, you have three velocities, yes. So you, you do have to have three velocities. So you have one. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because because of this uh, tension. I mean, if you write on the the MHD equations, uh, you will see even in one D, you have a bx derivative of by with respect to x terms, which is a tension, and that modify the by component. Sure, but I was talking about but the, the velocity, the magnetic uh, field, uh, exerts a tension force and the velocity. So the velocity is non zero, it's changing with time. It depends only on x, so it's a vy of the x variable, okay? But it, so the vy does depend on x. So this is a, a variable that you must consider the, in the context of the MHD flow, okay? For, for any MHD problem, No, 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 ND can be one, okay? But you still have eight variables. Okay, because uh, you, so you have your x axis, okay? And you have so bx component as usual, and but then you have dy and dz, okay? Which depend only on x, but which are still not, uh, which are still part of the problem. Okay, dim and variables are not related. Dims and variables are not related. They are related in hydro, but not in MHD. In MHD, it's always eight. Okay. Um, so then, once you have done that, you must choose your solver. So you have hydro and MHD. Okay. Um, and then, importantly, you must define the path of your patch. If you have, a, uh, if you had to modify some of the routine, you put them in the patch. So you specify the path of your patch. And then, what happens is that during the compilation. Uh, the, uh, the compiler is first trying to take the routine in, in, the, in the patch, okay? And if it finds it there, that's it. It will not try to look uh, at, say, uh, the other directories, okay? So the priority is put on the routine which I find in the patch. 
Okay, so that allows you, as I said, to easily uh, set up new problems without to each time give the new version of answers. Okay. Um, and then to, to launch it, so I guess it's standard, you just uh, take this. Um, something important to know, in 1D, uh, all the data are actually put in this run.log file. Okay, so here in this run.log file, you will find all the information like uh, you see the time steps, uh, total energy, kinetic energy, and so on. You see uh, and the, the state of the mesh as well, the level which are refined and so on. So you will find many information on, on, the, on the run. And in, in 1D, all your fields are actually directly put in this run.log file. Okay? So uh, in 2 and 3D, they are written in the different directory. So uh, one directory per output is created. Okay, and the, your results will be located there. And you will see uh, a file like AMR, which contains the grid information, and hydro, which contains the, uh, the hydro information. You will also find gravity, if you have gravity, and particles, if you have particles. Okay, so there will be one uh, set of file per, um, uh, and, yeah, per physical processor, say. Okay, uh, a little bit more on the structure of the mesh, because things are slightly more complicated than what I, I just explained. Um, for reasons that will become clearer uh, Wednesday, essentially, uh, we use uh, a stagger mesh. Essentially, it is, to, it is to maintain DV, okay? To maintain the divergence of the magnetic field constant, we, the, the magnetic field must be written on the face of your mesh, okay? So the, um, all the hydro variables are centered, uh, are the center of the of the mesh, um, but the magnetic field, okay, is written on the faces like this. Um, so it's uh, it's like it. And um, because of of this uh, different location. Um, it, it was uh, difficult in the context of um, an AML grid, which are which have a very um, uh, complex, I would say, mesh, um, which are very complex mesh and, and therefore a very complex data structure to uh, to handle this um, without expanding uh, the number of variables. Okay, because essentially you will have to have two sets of variables at slightly different position, and that's combined with a very complex mesh structure would make the life very hard. So for that reason, uh, the strategy uh, which has been retained is to increase the number of variables in the code. So uh, what uh, is done is that each cell okay, carries uh, the two plan panels uh, of, the, of the magnetic field, so the two uh, dy and dx components and dz components. Okay, so for each cell, you have actually two uh, sets of magnetic field, uh, one which corresponds to this phase and, and, and the, the other one which corresponds to this phase here. Okay, so there is sort of uh, redundancy of information because the cell, which is uh, the neighboring cell, so this one, which will also contain this uh, value of the magnetic field. Okay? But, okay, that was the price to pay to be able to combine uh, an name of scheme with a constraint transport method, so with the mesh. So when actually you analyze uh, your data, you will have 11 variables, not 8. Okay? So when you specify in the in the patch, so in the make file number of your variable it would say eight, but when you analyze the data you have eleven, uh, so essentially eight plus three uh, because of this uh, of this structure. Okay. Um, <coughs> so um, say you have compiled code, uh, you are ready to run it, but you need to set up your problem. And that's uh, done through the name list. Um, 
it's, the name is, uh, is not totally trivial, so I'm going to, to describe it uh, one, one example to give you a flavor, and then you can look in the log file to really uh, look at all parameters, but it can take some time. So uh, the, the strength of the, of the name is architecture is that you do not need to specify all parameters uh, and the order that it matters. Okay? So uh, it's um, kind of more flexible than having a mere ASCII file, for example. Um, and uh, if the parameter is not found, then the default which is specified uh, in, the, in the modules will be used, okay? Um, so, which means that when you, when you look at one name list, there are actually many more parameters that you don't see because they are not used, uh, and uh, it means that you are using implicitly the default version, okay? So it's, it's important to be sufficiently aware of what are the crucial points in order not to be missing something. Um, so, uh, you have uh, so a few uh, so subnet list which allows you to uh, choose so the, the modules like Poisson, Adibo, etc. to choose the solvers you want to use because there are many, not many, but there are several solvers which have been implemented. Um, you uh, can define the AMR parameters, so exactly how you will define your grid. Okay, so the rules to, for the refinement. Um, uh, and then many problems uh, can be uh, uh, defined solely using this name list, as I described in a minute. You can define areas of your flow and set up all the, the variables uh, using, uh, using the name list. Um, and as I said, there is, a, there is this file that we will find in the doc. Uh, in the doc um, directory, which describes uh, the name list in more details. Uh, it may not have been always uh, been carefully updated, so sometimes you better directly read the code. Uh, and sometimes you want to read uh, in the routine to understand more or less what it does. Sometimes. Um, okay, so let me uh, try to go through one example of. Uh, when name this example, so you see it's sort of free page. Um, um, so essentially, when you open this <coughs> name list, that's what you find. So hydro is just your name is hydro. There is no Poisson here, which means that you are not solving uh, self gravity. Um, every map is a parameter useful for the so-called load balancing, which means when you have different CPU, okay. Uh, you are attributing a different grid to different CPU, and uh, because it's an MEA scheme, the number of grid is changing with time, so it may happen that uh, all or a lot of load will be attributed to a single CPU. In that case, it would mean that your code will be extremely inefficient, because you will have one CPU doing all the job, and the other one doing nothing. Okay, so to avoid that, you have to redistribute the, the load, uh, so the, the cells within the, your CPU, and you do that every uh, end lap uh, step. Okay. Um, so end control is the number of uh, is a number of steps after which you will uh, display uh, the information on your time steps. So typically, uh, as I was saying, the state of the grid the time steps itself, uh, various energies and so on, and also in 1D, you will download all your data, okay? So typically when you are doing 2D or, or 3D problem, this can be equal to 1, because then you can see all your time steps with all the information, and if you got a crash, say uh, suddenly your time steps is becoming crazy, like you, you go in your code and you immediately see just by looking at time steps when it happens, okay? So that's useful. But when you are doing 1D problem, because you are putting all your data uh, in, uh, in this file as well. You don't want to do that uh, too often, okay? So you probably have a number which is big like here, okay? Um, and the cycle is for this multi multiple time stepping. Uh, I will describe that further on Wednesday. 
But so the idea is that uh, if you have, say, level 1, which is uh, the coarse level, and level 2, which is the refined level, uh, you may want to do two time steps at level 2 before you do one time step at level 1. Okay? Obviously, if most of your grid is not refined, uh, so which means that you only a small fraction of your grid is refined, it, it's very inefficient to do uh, a time step for the whole grid uh, at, at the frequency, say, of the refined level. Okay? But you are, if you have many, many levels, like in the dense core calculation I was showing you, this, this course typically may use 10 AMR level, sometimes you can do even more. So the time steps at the finest level is very small with respect to the time step at the coarse level. So if you would do at each time uh, the time step for the whole grid, uh, it, it costs you a lot of CPU. So doing this subcycling, you know, allows you to reduce the CPU time. And here you see, again, a structure that is very common in this name list. Uh, here that's the number of level, uh, so say between level 1, 2, 3, 4, or say it's between 7 and 11 here. Uh, so you apply for the 4 level the value 1. Okay? So that's, will be, that's a very common way to write things in this name list. So which means essentially that in this problem there would be no subcycling. Okay? You could have, for example, here 2 star 1 and then 2 2. So that would mean that for the 2 first level there would be no subcycling and then for the, the 2 last level there would be a subcycling. So you would do essentially uh, 2 time steps at say level 11, 2 time steps at level 9, uh, 10, uh, and then uh, all the level will be synchronized. Okay, so you can you can fine tune this uh, as you want by essentially having a list here of uh, values between one and two that would say whether the, the this level is synchronized with the the following level or not. Okay. So, so the first number there has to be the same number as the number of levels that you're looking at. Uh, no, it doesn't has to. Uh, as I said, you could have one 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 one. Or two 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 or one one two two. It's a it's a shortcut. It's just a way to, to write quicker one 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 one. Okay. Okay. No, because eight, nine, ten, eleven. I mean seven is the core level. Okay. So that's the first is the first refined level, which is eight. Okay. Um, right. So then uh, this so AML param. So specify the, the course level, which means uh, you, you start your simulation uh, at, at level 7. So level 7 means that you will have 2 to the 7 element of grid in 1D. Okay? Okay, so 2, two to the 7 is uh, 1 to 8. Okay, so 128 cells in 1D. If you are 3D, it's this number to the 3. Okay? Um, and level max is the level up to which you are allowed to refine. Okay? Um, and max, so it's an important parameter, it's essentially the allocation memory. So because in a, when you do AMR, you don't know a priori uh, the number of cells you will have at the end of your computation or during your computation. So you have an idea, but you don't know this number accurately. Okay? Um, so you, you need to allocate uh, enough space in order to uh, store your grid and um, this has to be large enough so what is specified here is the number of grid per CPU okay and the grid will contain eight cells so if you want to have rough ideas of the, um, the memory it corresponds to you must first multiply this number by eight to give the number of cells then you must multiply this number by 11 uh, to, give, to have the number of variables, and then you must multiply the number by 8 to get the number of octs in, um, in, two, in a double precision. So typically, uh, if you roughly multiply this number by 1,000, okay, you get the uh, memory you ask uh, for your CPU. Okay? So if you have two 
giga per CPU, which is kind of standard numbers. You must not have the number that is larger than 2 million here, otherwise you will saturate the memory of your CPU. Okay? Um, if you have not been allocating enough memory, uh, the code will stop, and we'll get a message like uh, increase and with max, which means that there is not enough space, so you have to increase that number. Can you go here? And where does it allocate all the memory at a minimum? Sorry, I, I Does RAM just allocate all its memory when it starts? So it allocates all these empty RAMs yeah. at, at t equals zero. At yeah. So, that, so if you run out of memory, whatever memory you need. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. And expand is a, a parameters. So when you decide to refine a cell, you may want to also refine the neighbors around in order to get this kind of smooth transition. And so you can refine. One, two, three, four labels, and that's what an expand specifies. Okay, so if you have a very, very big N expand, you will end up defining all the grid. Okay, uh, box N is the size of the box. Boundary parameters allow you to specify uh, the boundaries within your within your code. So essentially, if you have a 2D problem, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight boundaries. Okay, which are surrounding your mesh. Okay, and uh, they can be uh, sort of uh, described by <coughs> the coordinates i, that will be minus 1, 0, 1, and y, that will be minus 1, 0, 1, okay? So by doing these coordinates, you specify uh, the boundary that you are describing, so that's what this thing does. So in, in 1D, it's essentially taking minus 1, which is the one on the left, and y1, which is the one on the right, uh, and then you specify the type which are defined in, in Ramses. So the default zero is periodic, and two is vanishing gradient. One, I think, is reflective boundary. I never used it, so I'm not totally sure. Um, but so if you can, you can look at uh, the documentation and see and see what is uh, there exactly. Okay. Um, Oh, no, 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 sorry, yeah, no, no, that, that can be uh, anything, and that, that's going to be minus one, one, but it's a very simple coordinate system. Okay, okay. Uh, then this uh, init params uh, allows you uh, to define uh, a lot of problems directly from the name list without uh, modifying the code. So here, what is set up is one of the problems uh, I will uh, describe later, so it's a uh, one dimensional MHD uh, shock cube. Um, so you see, you, you specify two regions in your flow. Uh, so you, uh, the geometry will be simple, the, the square. In 1D, it's just a segment. Uh, so you specify the center. So typically, here it's uh, <coughs> one quarter and three quarter of the box length. Okay, and you specify the length, half of the box length here. So you have essentially have a problem where you have two states uh, occupying uh, each of them occupying half of the box. Okay, so this is a typical shock tube test. Okay, when you have a jump in the physical conditions occupying say the left part of the box and the right part of the box, and then you have all your, vari your variables, so the density, the free velocity, as I was uh, saying, for the MHD case, the uh, the pressure, and then the, the free uh, magnetic field. Okay. Um, then the output problem that allows you to control the frequency of the output. Okay. Um, then the, the current conditions. Okay. I'm assuming most of you know what current condition is. I will uh, get into more details tomorrow. Um, essentially, it's said to be smaller than one if you want the scheme to be stable, and uh, the closest to zero. Uh, the more accurate the scheme, but the slower the code. So, uh, usually with the kind of good enough scheme, uh, you can have values close to 1, 2.8. Um, another important parameter is the slope type, which controls uh, the accuracy of the, of the reconstruction, uh, which is operated in order to get second order accuracy. So, so something I will describe tomorrow in more detail. 
um, in order to get second accuracy, yeah, you need to um, reconstruct or interpolate the variables at the boundary of the of your mesh. Um, and the way you do that is extremely important. Um, if you don't pay attention to that, the, the code will be unstable and crash immediately. So you have different strategy which gives you more accuracy and uh, uh, different accuracy and different stability. And typically, the more stable, the less accurate and the weakness. Okay? So uh, zero means no reconstruction. So then you have just one order scheme, so very diffusive but very robust. Um, one is kind of standard. It's sort of almost a one order, not exactly, but almost. And <coughs> usually it does not crash, not always. Uh, and then the uh, slope, I mean, this two is kind of more aggressive the slope. Uh, so typically, in uh, the test problem, it will work. But in the end problem, it will crash. That's the sort of uh, theory. Okay? So you will may want to probe or disprove this. Uh, and then you have to select uh, your the solver, so how you exactly solve the equation, and that's uh, something we'll describe tomorrow. And um, again, you, you can have very uh, diffusive and very robust solver, like the Lima like Fuduish, okay, <coughs> which is a kind of, kind of diffusive solver but very robust. And then you have a more subtle and more precise solver, like the O1 or the Achille one, uh, which may sometimes uh, crash. Um, and then finally, you have to uh, specify your uh, refinement strategy so to decide which criteria you are going to use to uh, refine the grid. Uh, and so there are more than that here. That's essentially refining on the gradient. So you, you want that the jump between two uh, neighbor cells is smaller than 1%, otherwise you refine. Okay? And um, uh, there are other uh, criteria available. Uh, one of them is the genes criteria, so you may want to refine the gene length of the bone. And another is sort of called mass SPH. So essentially, you, uh, the idea is that you allow the maximum mass within your cell, and if you exceed this threshold, then you refine it. So it's a kind of following your flow in a Lagrangian way, so a kind of SPH way. Um, and then uh, you have to decide when you create a new cell, okay, you have to interpolate because you have a core cell and suddenly you have four cells at the same place, so you have to decide the value that you are attributing to these new cells. Um, and then the first thing is to decide which variables you use to that. You have we have essentially two sets of variables. One is the so-called primitive variables, so that's the velocity, density, and pressure. And the other set are the conservative variables, which are the momentum, energy, and density, which are effectively conserved by the, uh, by the volume, uh, uh, finite volume method, so the formulation of flux that I will describe tomorrow. Um, and then finally, you have, to, uh, you have to decide how you interpolate uh, the flow in order to reconstruct. Uh, the, or to, to find the, the value of the new cells, so you have to do some linear interpolation. So again, zero would be uh, no interpolation at all. So you just take the value of the more new cell, and then one or two are different types of cells. Okay. So uh, Mark, how do, I, how do I need to be accurate with the time? Uh, well, extremely that, sharp, or that, that, that depends on how hungry people are. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 so it's not like, you know, food, okay. it's a dining hall, the food will waste, but, you know, you may start finding that people throw things at you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'll, I'll try not to be too long. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm sure that what I was expecting. So, so then uh, the next step, once you have, say, run the code, is actually to uh, read and analyze the data. Um, so as I was saying, the structure of the data is a bit complex. It's a kind of hierarchical tree, like he has uh, has been described by, by Thomas before. Um, and, uh, and and moreover, the standard is a sort of just uh, home-made binary format. So there is no uh, public tool that you can use to easily read this data. 
so there are kind of three solutions. Um, I, will, I will let you decide the one you prefer, but I will highly recommend the second one if you are not used to uh, uh, actually read data and the code. So, or maybe to start with, it's better to use the second one. Then, then you, you will do whatever you want. But, okay, so solution one. Uh, is to use the Fortran routine provided in the files util f90. Uh, for example, you will find this mr 2 cube uh, file, which is essentially will scheme through the grid and produce a nice uh, a Cartesian grid. Okay, it will do everything, uh, averaging, smoothing, everything, uh, and then you will have 3D nice data. Okay, uh, but then uh, you you have to uh, to read. The output file that you produce for IMR2 cube, and then you need to use your, your preferred software to do the analysis and everything. Okay? Um, so, the solution two, which is probably the easiest in the context of this school where we want to get a sort of quick uh, setup, but is to use the ideal uh, package with, which is provided in again, utils. Uh, the reason why it's, it's simpler is because it has been. Uh, developed by Roma initially, and so many problems are set up. Many things are already available to test the code and so on. So it's a sort of well-improved uh, um, development. Um, and so typically, you have to run the following second. So first, read AMR. Um, so just specify the, the file. Then you, you get the structures with the, the grid. And then with the hydro, so then you get the analytical variables. Uh, I'm to say will give you a list of cells, okay? So if uh, you want to de deal with your particles, with your cells as if they were particles, okay? So you have a sort of cloud of, of particles with their position and their variables attached, and then you can do whatever you want. Um, then you can use this routine ray 3D, which essentially will integrate along one specified axis, so here the y-axis, and so you specify the variables you, you need, and then you, you get an uh, integrated uh, map, or just you can also take the maximum. Um, or you can also uh, do this uh, sort of cut 3D stuff, which uh, allows you to, uh, to do actually a cut in your, in your data. So then that's a 2D, 2D cut. And then you can then plot it with this, uh, with this variable to be 2D that will uh, store a 2D map. Okay? And there is another, I think, mesh EGK uh, routine that will also produce you uh, a 3D regular uh, Cartesian mesh. Okay? So that's sort of easy. I just noticed that I get this extremely slow here. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I just noticed that the data take a, a while to be read. So I don't know whether it's a local issue. Usually it's slow, but not as slow. So that may be an issue for big ones. And then solution three. So more recently, a package has been developed by students that didn't like the idea. Uh, and I think they are right. I mean, idea is maybe not the future. I mean, Python is maybe the future, but OK. Uh, so this is available here. Uh, the problem is that, well, those students were uh, cosmology students, and so they were not interested by the magnetic field. The version does not handle the magnetic field. Uh, a student of mine uh, developed a kind of NHD version, uh, which is installed here, uh, but I, I encountered some problem in reading the magnetic field, so I'm trying to have him <laughs> solving that. Uh, so I hope uh, it will be solved uh, soon. Uh, soon. But I mean, you can already read the magnetic field. Few, uh, the many tax grants, but don't have access to magnetic field, so you can already do a lot of things. Um, so um, I think for advanced studies, it's uh, probably a very interesting tool. And uh, to use it, you have uh, uh, I put here this file uh, on my uh, on my account. You say the example of PDF, where you see it's very easy to uh, to, to to get you started. And there is also a, a routine that you can find in my account which is called slice something and that allows you to uh, or if you look, look just at my python.com uh, file you will see an example of how this routine is done so that, that could be a, a nice uh, way to start um, okay 
I'm, was, I'm going now to present a set of tests and our homework um, that you can, as I said, run during this set of, of this school. Um, I just would like to stress um, a few issues with numeric in general. So, God testing is important because, well, it allows you first to check that your equations are correctly implemented. Uh, and very importantly, to understand the limit of the method that you are using in terms of algorithm and resolution. And I think it's important to realize, uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware of that, that um, just because you have a finite resolution, this has a strong consequences. This introduces a numerical dissipation or diffusion um, that may or may not be a problem. But your job as a computing scientist is to understand what your method does to your problem. Okay? And you, it's important to understand what can be trusted in, in, your, in your simulation and what can't be trusted. Okay? And, most, and you, are, you are sure that things that there are things that can't be trusted in a simulation, you are not sure that things can be trusted in the simulation. Okay? So all the game is to disentangle that and to assess the validity of a fraction of the information that your data uh, contains. Okay? Um, and that must be done by repeating the calculation using various methods and various resolution. Okay. So it, essentially, you must always run the same problem with a different resolution. Okay, possibly a set of resolution. And then try to see how the feature you are to set in depends on the resolution. Okay. Um, um, and it's also a very important aspect uh, to confront the metal models with analytical results, not only because you want to assess the numerics, but also because you want to extract the physics of the problem. And in a sense, doing a, a simulation is like doing a numerical experiment uh, that you could do, say, with the flow, with the real flow. Uh, you have the results of the experiment, but then you need to, to grab, actually, the, the physics of the problem. And that's, to do that, you need to develop some small analytical modeling with a few parameters that you can easily track. Okay? Um, and of course, comparison is also very important. Okay, um, so I, I will propose a several tests, um, and depending on your current knowledge on, and interest, okay, you can decide what, uh, which are the most interesting for you. Um, so most of the tests have already been performed with some tests, so there may be patches available. Um, I, I would recommend uh, to maybe select one or two problems already coded, um, maybe just an list and then change everything. Okay. And then compare the result to make sure that you understand exactly what's going on. The resolution, the server, I mean, everything you can, the frequency of all the things. What is that, what's that done, when you know how to access the data and so on, then I would recommend to select one problem and to maybe try to code it from scratch from this by yourself. Okay? You try to put really your hands in, in the code and go through all the mistakes that we have been already doing before you. And, uh, and then, well, maybe if you have problems, you can look at the batch to help you. I, mean, I will let you judge of doing what is good for you. Uh, but I think that could be a valuable strategy. OK, so the first uh, test is the so-called uh, classical shock tube test. So as I was saying, you have initially two, two states. And then you just let this thing evolve. Uh, this sort of problem is at the very heart of the Riemann server I'm going to describe tomorrow. Okay? Uh, you have essentially uh, three waves, which uh, deeply, of course, uh, reflect the physics of the problem. Um, so you have a shock. Okay? You have uh, the contact discontinuity, which is a kind of entropy propagating uh, mode, where you see uh, the, the pressure, um, the pressure is, is constant through this uh, entropy, uh, so the pressure is constant through this this jump, this contact discontinuity. And then you have the refraction waves uh, that you see is not a single discontinuity, it's a sort of continuous profile. Uh, that problem is, is still similar, which means that as uh, time goes on, this will essentially, uh, the profile will stretch, and the, variables, the value of the variables will not change this time. And these particular properties of cell similarity is going to be used with the, the, for the Riemann problem. 
Um, so then you have the set off test. You're just putting some energy at some point of the ring and letting it go. Okay. So that problem was first studied for nuclear weapons, I guess, and then it turns out to be uh, relevant in the context of supernova. So you can be uh, you can do one D, two D, three D, and there is a there is a nice idea routine uh, which automatically perform comparison with an ethical solution. Okay, so that's an easy, uh, that's a very nice uh, way to check the density of file. So you have the density profile and uh, the density, you have the, the grid which has been used in this context, and that's the 3D explosion where you see the outgoing motions and the dense shell and the right five more. And maybe as a suggestion for more to one which are more advanced in the room, Maybe you could uh, go and study supernova explosion with magnetic field, for example. And that's, there are a few uh, examples of uh, these kind of studies in the, in the literature that you can find, and maybe you can compare with their results. Okay, then uh, you could study the Kelvin Elmholtz instability. So it's a kind of shear flow instability when you have a strong shear okay, in, in the problem at the interface uh, of the, the shear. Uh, essentially, because of the <coughs> of the Doppler uh, effect of the, the sine wave propagating back and forth, you will have um, you will have an instability that develops here, so uh, that you can see uh, appearing in this uh, this interface. So there, there's a patch and that uh, then this uh, you can find ways also uh, comparison in the, in the literature, and you could also, for example, try to measure the growth rate of this instability from the numerical simulation and compare it with the analytical uh, That could be an interesting problem to um, So then you have the uh, Renetano instability, which is what happens when you have a, a gravity. So there is a gravitational field like this. And you have a, a heavy fluid on top of a light fluid. The pressure at equilibrium, OK, but still, uh, these fluids <coughs> Field gravity is this is smaller than, than this one, and, and so it, it will try to uh, essentially penetrate towards the, the uh, gravitational field, and as a consequence, the one is going to go uh, uh, that direction. So you generate this, this nice instability. So again, that's something you may want to. Uh, you can measure the growth of, of the development of the instability and compare it with the analytical rates. Um, so you have the so-called blob test. Which have been also extensively performed uh, by actually uh, I think many people from the cosmology uh, <coughs> community. Uh, well, it's not exactly true that there's no patch. I mean, I would like you to develop it, and it's easy to do it by yourself. Um, so you have a patch of dense of dense gas, okay, which is moving supersonically in a, in a diffuse medium. Uh, so it's essentially a clap okay, moving in a different medium. So you have local pressure at the ground because uh, this, this gas is, is warmer than this one. Okay, but you have a shock front that forms, and you have gas running around. So you have a combination of all instabilities, like really Taylor and uh, uh, Kevin Elmholtz. So you see that you, the fuel clamp is quickly dissolved. Okay, you have uh, essentially uh, this uh, all this sort of turbulence in the in the wake of the, of the coals, and, and after a while, so this is when I put in my conditions here, so this, this side goes here, so you see that the club is completely disrupted. Okay. So this is a nice problem, and there is a, a suite of, of tests which have been performed by Agios et al, um, where they, they compare, actually, they compare many codes, well, many five codes, so two SPH and three grid codes. Uh, and so you see the different uh, results you get from the different codes. Um, so maybe it's a good idea because in the context of this school, it will handle many or many or three, or three or codes, including SPH1. So maybe it's a good idea for you to try to repeat these figures using the different codes that will be used in the context of this school to compare the results. Okay. Um, so for MHD, but that was hydro up to that point. For MHD, um, there is a classical. Uh, a test because this is an exact solution. So this is um, uh, nonlinear uh, torsional alpha waves. Okay, 
So that's a 1D problem, and you have a BX component and a BY component, okay, in such a way that the, uh, so you have essentially a cosine and a sine. So the, uh, the pressure, the metric pressure is constant, okay, so that's why it's an exact solution. Uh, but you have the tension, and of course the tension uh, leads to a wave propagation, okay, so you have a nice circularly polarized alpha waves that propagates in your box, okay? And uh, if there was no dissipation, it would not dissipate, uh, because it's an exact solution, unlike a shock, for example, which would develop a discontinuity that would dissipate energy at entropy. It's an exact solution, so in principle, it should not dissipate. It turns out that if you have not enough mesh points, it will dissipate quickly, because of the numerical diffusion, so you can use this problem, for example, to, uh, to estimate your numerical diffusion in the code. And you can repeat the same simulation with uh, two solvers. So this is a diffusive solver, and this is an accurate one. So you see the difference. The, this one is less dissipated than this one. And as you increase the number of cells, uh, you see the, the, the time, uh, the distribution time increasing. And for very, very, for high resolution, uh, you see barely no, dis no, dis no, no diffusion or no, no dissipation, at least for this time of integration. Okay? So you can play around with that, and actually, uh, you could even verify that you have second order accuracy, because uh, the, the second accuracy method, um, for second accuracy method, the, number, the dissipation depends as the, the square of the mesh. Uh, so, you can verify that, that the behavior, the, the discussion you estimate, varies like the square of the mesh. Um, so that's the kind of setup you have to, to, uh, to put. Um, so you have two, uh, I mean, a large number of uh, shock tube. Uh, this is one I, I took from the, this important paper, Miyoshi and Susano. That, uh, that design this HLED server. So tomorrow, or maybe Wednesday, I expect to, to give you, uh, to describe you uh, accurately the HLED server because it's the, the server which is uh, most applied at the moment in the community. So it's the best we have at the moment for HLED. Uh, and so that's, um, that's the, the kind of uh, uh, figure you get. So you have essentially uh, two fast Maybe waves, uh, two alpha waves, okay, and a mixture of contact discontinuity and slow alpha modes. And you see all solvers here, they do equally well for the fast energy modes, for reasons that we'll discuss tomorrow, but they don't do equally well uh, for the, uh, the alpha waves and, uh, and the slow modes. Okay, and, uh, so something that we'll uh, see tomorrow, but you can typically use that solver and use that problem and again vary the resolution and uh, the solvers to see the differences. Uh, something important when you are doing a code testing, uh, you would like to actually have the, the coarsest possible grid. Okay, you don't want to have one or two points, it will be ridiculous, but a very small number, okay, because this is where you are really testing the accuracy and the robustness of your methods. If you have an infinite number of points, you don't care of the methods. You take any, anything, it would work, just because you have a huge accuracy. So to, to really distinguish between methods, you want to put stress on them. Uh, and putting stress on them means you need to have very few good points. Okay? That's a sort of uh, useful strategy. Um, yeah, just to do. Then you have the famous uh, 2D uh, odd lactant problem, which is a kind of uh, um, problem that comes out at some stage. There is no analytical solution. I mean, the difficulty at some, at some stage to test a code is that there are very few uh, analytical uh, solutions. So when there is nothing, uh, you have to invent something. Say, so, well, okay, that sounds like a good problem. And, and then you try to do your best to compare with something. So something uh, can be a very high resolution method, a very high resolution run, okay? So you do, uh, after you do the standard debugging, uh, so you expect the, the core, the code model to be working. You, you do you have the biggest run you can you can perform, 
that's your sort of preference, and then you degrade the resolution and you compare the different methods. That's the common strategy. Then, of course, you may want to do uh, cut comparison. So that's uh, the standard uh, Riemann problem, uh, sorry, uh, Ozakton problem, um, which is already coded. So that's a comparison of what I was saying. So two, two methods. So that was uh, one of the first, uh, I would say, uh, code that I developed, and uh, with good eye you can see here, there are some the method by this time are not as accurate as we have now, uh, but you see uh, things, uh, when, you, when you get that, you see it like it's and so on, you probably feel that you have improved slightly things, um, and then you can do, for example, like one, what you can find on the web, web page of Jim Stone, where you have a series of, of all that kind of problems. Uh, with a very high resolution and then integrate the resolution to see what happens. Okay, so again, it could be a good idea to repeat this series of calculation for different resolutions. Okay. And then finally, maybe for the more uh, advanced uh, of you, and, and maybe to have some sort of problems uh, that you can again repeat with different code during the context of this school, you could do the collapse calculation, um, which is, I guess, important for star formation. Uh, so the idea is to have something simple. It's essentially a uniform density sphere initially, which is gravitationally unstable, so and which is uh, in a uniform or in solid body rotation. Okay? So very simple initial conditions. So this is described by two two numbers: uh, the initial thermal of gravitational energy. Okay, so typically uh, value between point two and point five. That's what we find. Uh, low rotation, typical of what is observed in the, in the, in the ISM, so uh, say 3% of rotation, and sometimes you may want to have an M equal 2 perturbation in such a way that you have break, broken the symmetry by hand and not just the code uh, letting uh, do that for you by amplifying the make error. Um, and uh, so that's an example of. Um, uh, that's uh, the time evolution of, of that problem where you see uh, the disk, kind of disk is uh, in spiral modes forming and, and it will eventually fragment. Um, it's sometimes called the Ross and Wernheimer problem and you, you see the comparison with SPH. Right? Um, so maybe, again, it's, it's, and, and that's, for this kind of problem, you need extensively the IMR, as I was saying at the beginning, because um, the, the scale uh, shrinks with the gene length, essentially, and typically here the density varies by, say, six or seven orders of magnitude, and as you know, the gene length uh, scale like the density to the minus one half, so if you uh, increase the density by, say, six order of magnitudes, it means that your spatial length has, has actually drops by 10 to the 3, okay? uh, which leads then to a very, very large uh, mesh. But with the IMR, you can, you can zoom very efficiently uh, without paying an extra, uh, a, a very, a very uh, unreasonable CPU cost. Okay? Um, so that's that's really a nice problem to do in the context of this room, and I will then encourage you to try to repeat that. So comparing AMR and SKH, and you can do that with different codes and methods again. Uh, you could introduce B, and you could see the B whether you see the outflow. Okay. So you can play around with this, and you will be quickly uh, touching the limit of uh, our knowledge, huh, because uh, this kind of problem is still under consideration. In particular, at the moment, uh, people are. Still trying to struggle with the, the MHD, the non ideal MHD, the turbulence, the right processor, and everything. So that's really close to the, the research um, at the moment. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm finished. So thank you for your attention.